Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the 5-1 Speedway Show. Last week's, oh sorry, last time's guest was uh, Martin Dugard. We had a fantastic long conversation about uh, his uh, his career, the ups, the downs, what he's currently doing and how he was promoting and everything. It's one to check out. I would thoroughly recommend that. Tonight, my guest is a real superstar, especially in the Midlands, mainly the Cradley area. Uh, also, he <laughs> has won a couple of world championships, so he's hit the heights and everything, both in the pairs, the team, and also the individual. Tonight, my guest is the one and only Bruce Pennell. Hi, Neil. Hey, Good Bruce. to talk to you. And you, man. And of course, yeah. England. Yes, yes, sunny England, you know. Yeah, <laughs> burr. Yes, yes, we've got our winter warmers all on and they're ready to go. <laughs> I almost wore my shorts to work today. It's only 75 degrees here right now. It's pretty nice. Oh, I don't mean to rub it in or anything, but no, no, I didn't. No, no. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you're allowed to, aren't you? So. <laughs> That's right. So, so, Bruce, how's your um, 2020 pandemic year been? Has it hit you hard with your business? You know, uh, we're, we're considered the essential um, we, uh, most of our work is freeway work, you know, the motorways, uh, high rise buildings, it's, we're all commercial. So we've been very, very fortunate to be able to keep really busy through this crap. You know, um, we had a little bit of a slowdown through the, through the holidays, which we always do. Uh, and of course it's, it's a little unknown to all of us right now in America about, you know, the new re-election and all that too. So right now, uh, I've got to say that we're real fortunate uh, compared to so much so much that we have seen over the last six, eight months. You know, it's really frightening and I feel so sorry for all the above that have struggled through it. So we're, we've been doing great. Just, uh, we just keep rocking on and, and all of our employees are working hard. We do a lot of night work as well. Um, so we're hanging in there big time. That's good to hear, you know, because obviously um, most businesses would be struggling in this pandemic year with uh, a lot of things. I know a lot of businesses over here in the UK have struggled, but uh, fortunately key workers like yourself and myself, because I'm a postman over here, so I'm a class as a key worker um, and things like that. So, yeah, it is nice to keep busy. But has as, as the family been all good and everything? Everyone been good with uh, the pandemic and everything? Yeah, we haven't, uh, knock on wood, we haven't had any outbreaks. One of our employees did um christmas day but he he had zero symptoms whatsoever he went down and tested he was next to his aunt and um an uncle that 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 came down with it he tested positive but he never once had one bit of illness whatsoever plus he was away from us he works out out in the field a lot so we've been pretty fortunate we certainly have heard a lot of friends and family that have come down with it and a few that have passed away unfortunately but this uh, i just can't wait for all these vaccines and whatever it's going to take to 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 get this right yeah i mean the vaccines are just really rolling out over here in the uk so hopefully fingers crossed and touch wood that it can cross over the seas and you guys can get it yeah, you know, we haven't, uh, it's just really those essential workers, all the, you know, the hospital workers, uh, they're, they're able to get it. We aren't yet. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of says, so you want to put that in your body? I said, trust me, I've had a lot worse in my body over the years. So I think a little shot's not going to hurt me. I'm going to definitely do it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I totally yeah, agree. Yeah, you know, if it can stop you getting it and you can live a healthier life, that's all that matters at the end of the day. I agree. Exactly. I agree. Exactly. We need to move on. We need to get well and move on for sure. Yeah, because we need some yeah. racing as well more than anything. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah, and I even feel bad for the promoters and you know the sponsors and of course the riders. You know, they're just dormant. You know, it's such a bummer. Even here in in the states, as little as you know, Speedway is not very big, obviously, but you know we've been affected buy it here too and, and and there's there's a few of these guys that make a living at it obviously it's a lot bigger in europe and and the uk but uh, it's just a shame you know mostly all motorsports and to watch football or anything with an empty stadium it's it's, it's almost like I don't, I don't even want to watch this you know yeah but it's, it's no a bummer there's no atmosphere or anything like that there so how can right. you sort of enjoy it right yeah. Plus, my California, my California teams haven't gone very well in the football playoffs, so <laughs> I don't want to watch it even then. 
No, then you can just close your eyes and go, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, I know that obviously Kelly Inman hasn't run all season. At industry, he's not been mm. allowed to run. Um, but fortunately, Steve Evans has managed to get some meetings on over at Paris. And, uh, right. and obviously this new track that I've seen, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's at uh, Bakersfield, um, a new track that yep. Steve's opened up. Back in the old days, Bakersfield was a big Wednesday night track for us and it moved to Saturday nights. But Digger Helm was our... Uh, promoter back in the day and he was a fantastic guy and uh that's actually the track that i streaked around when streaking was big <laughs> i want to say that was about 70 77 or 78 i had my boots and my helmet on along with two other riders did a couple of hot laps with no clothes on <laughs> yeah and uh good thing they didn't have cameras with big lenses on because that's what have taken to see me anyway <laughs> <laughs> oh dear big ego should we say <laughs> no very little ego oh, that's what i'm trying ego. to say <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh no, that, that's great that's great to hear but obviously because um i have a few programs because i collect memorabilia stuff over here and things like that and i've got a few programs like the american finals and stuff like that so like um bakersfield san bernardino and places like that i've got programs for and it's like you look at the card like you said you said you had yourself you had the bass boys you know you had um was it like sunny nutter and people like that all in the, in the meetings and you think geez you had to have those sort of days back again would be great yeah you know i'm so thankful to have been to have grown up in that era mm -hmm. and to see what it's like now it's just kind of such a bummer to see and um you know there's always been a lot going on in california with football and different motorsports and it's never been the most popular sport mm -hmm. however back in those late seven i should say even early 70s to to mid 80s it was huge. I mean, we had five nights a week. Yes, at the same tracks, but uh, I made a great living mm -hmm. racing here when I first started. We would even get paid at Costa Mesa an overage if there was, you know, 10,000 people. And Harry Oxley took really good care of all of us riders back in the day, as did the other promoters, you know. So, um, yeah, I miss those days. And uh, there was a lot of youth back in those days because the parents could see that you know their the sport is going to continue to grow so they would obviously introduce their their kids at a young age riding junior bikes back when we started dennis segalis and myself were uh probably a couple of the first juniors and they wouldn't even allow us to race because of insurance reasons and the motors in our junior bikes were the McCullough chainsaw motors, those really radical things. And they would, they were scary to ride, but we got to practice on them. And it was a good way for us to learn how to get sideways. Dennis's dad, uh, master Tony, Tony Segalas, great guy. He, uh, he had, we had a track right behind his office, literally 20 minutes from my house, you know, nowadays, of course, the noise and the pollution and all that there's yeah. Yeah. that's not available anymore it's hard to find a track to practice on but we had it really good growing up it was it was great times yeah i can imagine so because yeah. it seems like it was a very sort of laid-back uh atmosphere those sort of days you know everyone had a laugh had a joke sort of thing and of course the, the rivalry on the track was amazing i can imagine especially with like the handicap stuff and things like that you know i can imagine it was like very brutal on the track I, I gotta say that I think personally that I think handicap racing was so good for us American boys growing up. It really taught us to learn how to ride on the outside, to get out in the dirt. There was a lot of dirt on the tracks back in those days. And when we made that transition to England, I, gosh, I can remember my first maybe 10, 10 meetings at Cradley. People said that I was not going to live. Because I used to run around the outside because, you know, if I can't pass on the inside and if the tracks are slick, we have to make a different decision. You know, yes, it's further, the further way around the track, but how else are you going to pass them? You're going to hope for a mistake. Mm. Back in, back in those days, a lot of the riders didn't make a lot of mistakes. So that was the other way to, to get around the outside. And I truly believe that, a lot of us Yanks learned how to ride the outside because of the handicap program starting 60 yards 
behind the guys on on you know on the zero yard line and they were all good they just got moved up to first division yes they're making some mistakes but still they had a head start it was tough and but really a, a really great way of learning how to ride a speedway bike yeah, because like you said, it teaches different lines, inside, outside, cutbacks, whatever, you know. But it, it must have been sort of like a great thrill for yourself, you know. It gave you that sort of probably that buzz to go, yeah, I can really push myself against these sort of boys, you know, and uh, things like that. I mean, I've seen photos of the tracks being so deep, you know, and you think today the riders would struggle to just turn the things nowadays. And yeah. Whereas you're on your old uh, two-valve jowl or your, or your Weslake and you're pulling through it and these guys are absolutely covered, plus and head to toe in, in shale but it must have been like a great not even if you didn't ride to, to just watch it must have been great to see you know the the riders these days would probably say that it's a, a dangerous racetrack that they don't want to race on it right <laughs> yes uh there's a, there's a lot of those really good what i call backyard marker the handicapped guys that were on the backyard yardage mark like uh bobby schwartz and there was quite a few other ones sending that they weren't really good on the outside, mm. but they were extremely good on the inside. You know, so they did wait for those mistakes or they did push them, you know, to make mistakes. Um, but I, I got to tell you, I think it was a great learning tool for all of us. Sure was. Yeah, because you look when you come over to the UK at the old sort of um, ITV, BBC coverages of the World Team Cups and all the races, like I can think of one of you between yourself and Michael Lee at Kingston, I think it was a World Team Cup qualifier. You know, you're banging bars with each other and things like that and making Michael work really hard. Okay, he passed you. We let him have that one. But um, yeah, it's, it's a case of like, you know, but you can see that how the racing from back home in California really helps progress every single rider who came over. Yeah, and you're talking about Michael Lee passing me. Yeah, I'll never forget when he passed me in Gothenburg, yeah. uh, my first world final. That was a, a a tremendous race. I made some mistakes, but he was very hardcore, and you know, um, yeah, I, I turned a little bit on him going down the straightaway to kind of block him because he had some speed on me, uh, and he didn't make any mistakes. And then he freaking moved me out of the way. Yeah. I, I got to say to this day that Mike Lee, in my guesstimation, was one of the toughest guys I ever rode against. You know, yes, Ollie Olson had eyes in the back of his head. Peter Collins was extremely good around the outside. Um, Tommy Newtson, even Eric Gunderson, yes, they were kind of they were kind of youngsters at the time, but they were still really, really good. And uh, look at Ivan Major. You know, I was so fortunate to ride against these heroes, you know, and and um, did I get my ass beat a lot? I did. But I was fortunate to beat their asses a few times, too. Yeah, I mean, looking at your career from my notes and obviously the videos I'm limited to see, because obviously I wasn't around then. I was way too young for that. <laughs> but um, it's like, you know, that 80, 1981 and obviously the 82 seasons were your best years in the sport over in the UK. I mean, winning meetings, you know, for fun sometimes, but I can imagine the years from, like, I say, when you did the touring troop, was that about 77, 76, wasn't it, when you went to New Zealand and Australia to do the touring? Yeah, with the Ivan Ma Ivan Major Troop. Um, yeah, and actually, even before that, we went to Israel to ride uh, the world, uh, what they called the World Tour, um, and I was able to ride with Ovi Funden, you know, guys like that. And he even back in those days, I want to say that was maybe seventy six or seventy seven. He was still brilliant. Yeah, that imagine. you know that that weekend. We actually, in Israel, we rode on a, a, a school running track, and uh, obviously they didn't know how to prepare a track, so they made, Barry Briggs and Ivan made us saw cut all of the knobbies off our tires because it was so rough and the guys couldn't ride in it and they didn't want to really ruin the track, so they made us saw cut all the knobbies off our tires, except for one person, Ivan Major. Of course. He got to keep his knobbies on or whatever. <laughs> he sure did make better starts than us that day, but I was a rookie. I was just happy to be there, and I learned so much. I was with, you know, like Rick Woods, you know, one of my heroes back in the day in, in California Speedway. And uh, I'll never forget that week. It was 
absolutely tremendous. But, you know, yeah. And then after that, we were able to uh, go down to down, down in Aussie and New Zealand. And I got to ride against all the best Zen and Plek and, and, and uh, Eddie Jankars, you know, and man, I had some ter uh, just terrific days. I mean, yeah, the racing set that apart because it was amazing, but you know, I learned so much about the sport of speedway going on those tours Peter Collins, he and I became really good friends early on, Dougie Wire, um, and even Michael Lee, too. You know, I mean, I, we traveled a lot on the weekends to Germany and Denmark to, to race on the long track. You know, I wasn't very good at the long track. I loved it. I had a couple of good meetings, but, you know, uh, I just, uh, I, I look at some of these guys, you know, Egon and, and even Eric Gunderson and, and all the, all Ivan and the list goes on how good they were on the long track. Yes. I was there for a short amount of time, but, and I wanted to win. Don't get me wrong. You know, I just, uh, I, I, I was just a little bit better around the speedway tracks. Yeah. Cause wasn't yeah, the wasn't reserve in, eight, in 81 world final after winning the world final a few weeks earlier. That's kind of yeah. crazy to think about. Yeah. And, and grass track blew my mind because it was so rough, you know, and I, you know, I was used to a little, you know, small little oval, an eighth of a mile oval to begin with. And then, you know, of course, moving to Britain, the, the tracks are much larger. And, but um, I, I really, really loved it. But I, you know, I, I didn't have any test time racing long track because Cradley was on a Saturday night. I would, finish Saturday night and get on a small airplane and, and fly to, you know, to, to Germany or wherever it was, but no excuses. You know, I, I just wasn't, wasn't very good at racing long track. So how did you get into sort of doing grass track? Was it a case of someone like Peter Collins said, come along and try this then? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, of course, uh, Peter Adams, oh, okay. because okay. Pete Adams was my manager and, you know, he was booking a lot of those long track, races and uh for you know like ollie and even myself and and uh you no matter what experience you get you, you know it's one it's great money but it's great experience to learn how to ride all different types of let's just say in large speedway bikes the long track guys that race nothing but long tracks would say speedways a shortened version of long track, you know, and yeah, yeah they're correct. Yeah. It, you know, some of these, you know, even George hack back in the day, these guys were nuts and they're very, very good, but it was PC really that, you know, he and I traveled mostly together and he was so gracious enough to always give me pointers and tell me what's good and what's not good. Kind of like completely the opposite with Ivan major. Yeah. He wanted me there. But I think that Ivan just knew that, you know, this this kid could be pretty good in the day. I'm not going to give him, give him any more advice and what he needs right now sort of thing. Same with Oli. He didn't give me a lot of clues. It was guys like Peter Collins, Dougie Wire, uh, uh, you know, uh, let me see. And the kind of the list goes on, you know, I obviously Dave Jessup, we didn't see much of each other, but – you know, I would listen to everything they say, but you do it your way. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you consume everything, what everybody tells you, and then it's, it's kind of like your way. But the advice they give you is just phenomenal. It's, yeah, and it really, really was helpful, helpful to me. Yeah, I can imagine. So, yeah. Like you said, you in an era where you had so many top riders, you know, um, in the British League, every team was a team that, you know, uh, was full of heat leaders, full of stars, you know, and things like that. Uh, unlike, I would say, like uh, Eastbourne, um, we weren't that sort of good in the eighties. Uh, um, but Gordon like, Kennett, Gordon Kennett was true. amazing, and then Kelly rode for Eastbourne. Mm -hmm. Kelly Moran, you know, yeah, yeah Kelly, Kelly did have a good spell at Eastbourne. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, uh, okay, from an Eastbourne point of view, what are your sort of memories then from coming down to Arlington? And do you have any good ones? Well, see, because everybody had told us, I didn't get. I didn't ride a lot at Eastbourne. Okay. Uh, mostly open meetings. Yeah, there was one or two. And, you know, of course, our team meetings. But uh, they all said, you know, you're going to like this because it's a short track. And I did. I loved Eastbourne. Mm 
Mm. And I loved the town, you know. I think that we even stayed at, uh, at I think we, st we stayed, no, oh, at, yeah, Middle Ditches. I'm pretty sure we did. Yeah. Only a couple times. But, you know, again, we had to get back because we had meetings at Reading on a Monday night and, you know, Lester Tuesday night or whatever. We were back in those days, Neil, we were, I, my schedule was 160 nights out of the year. 160 nights out of the year. So we didn't get a lot of play time. You know, it was like we raced and then either get on an airplane or get in the car, get back on the motorway and head home. But um, I, I didn't get to spend a lot of time sightseeing anywhere, but Southampton and, you know, Eastbourne, are you kidding? It was, it was beautiful, but I had to get back to the Midlands, man. Yeah. Get back yeah, to Gravely. <laughs> so I think it's a long way from Eastbourne to back to the Midlands in those days, especially. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, it's just interesting to hear your sort of uh, memories of certain tracks and what you had to hear. Because like I said on these, on these uh, shows before, it's nice that the fans can hear different stories. That's what they want to hear. That's what yeah. I want to hear, you know, and things right. like that. That's so cool. But um, going back to how you came to sort of Cradley. You know, um, I know, I think, was you linked to some, wasn't it Bellevue maybe, were you linked with for a little while or something like that because of the Peter Collins connection? No, I was, uh, we were in Aussie and uh, all of a sudden the phone started ringing for me to hook up with a team in Britain. Mm. And I had, uh, it was really Dougie, Dougie Wire and PC that helped me and walked me through, okay, this is good money. This is a great track. That's a great promoter. This is a great team manager. And uh, believe it or not, I was really close to signing with Halifax. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Not only Halifax, but Kings Lynn. Mm. Okay, but Dan McCormick came up to the table and he put such a phenomenal deal together for me. You know, I needed a car when I was over there. I needed a place to stay, you know, because we're, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was kind of a kid and to move out of the country, it's one thing to move out of the state here in the U S but to move out of the country. And I was, you know, I, I was a family guy, you know, uh, my, my parents, I had just lost in an airplane crash and, uh, I, you know, I had a hard time, you know, leaving my, my brother and sister and cousins because of the accident. However, my will to win and you know, my, I, you know, this was my opportunity and I loved Speedway so much that, you know, I have to look after myself with the deal and I'll never forget Dougie wire told me, he goes, okay, that Cradley Heath, you better watch it. I've seen him literally turn cars over in the parking lot because the supporters get so pissed off. If you pick on the other riders or vice versa. So, and it, absolutely, I saw that happen a couple times, but um, they were really helpful in me and, and where I was to sign. And Dan McCormick did such a great job. Our team manager at the time was, was uh, 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 Mr. Wosley, you know, and he was a great guy as well. He's, uh, he's, he's passed away, but uh, as has Dan McCormick, but they were really terrific in the fans to me were sensational man they just took me under their wing and um i i think at the time bruce cribb was there and of course uh alan graham and and stevie bastable uh at, at cradley and so they they were helpful they were helpful not believe it or not even though i was on their team they didn't want to see me do too well <laughs> yeah, you can see you coming through the ranks and all of a sudden becoming this superstar because you had something different, probably. You know, you had the, had right. the, the long blonde hair, you know, the, the surface sort of look to you, you know, and things like that. I thought, oh, crap, here's this guy. He's going to start winning soon, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Did, did it take you quite a while then to get actually used to riding at Crowley then? Um, just the whole setup, you know, took a little bit. but uh, I And I crashed a few times. But, you know... I. Uh, like I said, I, I was used to going around the outside. I wasn't making good starts at all. Mm. That was the hardest thing for me to do is to learn how to make good starts. And I still, to, to, to the day that I won the championship, I was not a brilliant starter like Dave Jessup or even Michael Lee. You know, those guys are great starters, you know. Makes, makes your, your trip around, you know, the tracks a lot easier if you make starts. Mm. 
Um, so I, I struggle a little bit there, but I learn so much and I did learn how to make better starts, but, um, that was the thing for me was to get out of the start. And if I didn't get out of the start, you know, I'm not going to sit back there and, and watch these guys beat me. I had to learn how to pass, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, it took a little while to get used to it, mm -hmm. but I felt very, very confident, literally 10 meetings into my first year at Cradley. And then, of course, throw me at a different track on a Tuesday night, Lester. Again, what everybody says, you know, well, you're only going in a circle and yeah, yeah, you don't have any breaks. But, you know, if that track is literally 100 feet longer or wider or more narrow or the grip is different, it's all different, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the good thing. You learn because there were so many tracks back back in those days yeah. to learn from. Yeah, yeah, all, all different shapes and sizes. I mean, take for example, Hull the Boulevard. You know, you go from like a, a, a fairly wide cradle to a really narrow, straighted, long straights, tight corners of Hull. You know, you think you go there, you think, bloody hell, how am I going to get round it? You know, I can imagine. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've and seen, Exeter, yeah, Exeter, Exeter as well. Yeah. yeah, that was gnarly for me, you know. And and uh, Ivan was there when I when I moved to England, and so was Scott Autry, another one of my big hero, Scott Autry, they were fast around there, man. And I, I, I struggled a little bit, but, um, I got it in the end and I loved Hull. Yeah. And it was a big gnarly track, but you know what? I had a really good point average from the time that I started at Hull, or I should say all the opens or team matches or, or whatever it was. I, I really enjoyed Hull. It was bumpy, but it was, it was fast, but I, I got along great with that track. Yeah, because obviously then you had yeah, Kelly come over, then Sean Moran was there, John Cook was there as well. Which Siggy, Siggy was there. Siggy, how can I forget Siggy? Um, it's like, um, yeah, it was, it's really weird to see that Americans went to Hull, you know. Maybe it was Ian Thomas's flash, you know, I can do this for you type of attitude maybe. But but no, it's, how, how was that sort of like Dan McCormack to work with? Because obviously I only get to read it. I don't get to sort of hear it from the horse's mouth, sort of how was he as a promoter towards you? Okay, just step back really quick to Ian Thomas. Yeah. I always got along great with Ian. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was really good. I'll tell you one time, and I'll, I'll carry on with Dan in just yeah. a second, but we were at a World Team Cup uh, at, at Hull, and Ian was there. And um, all the Americans got there early, <laughs> and we took all the prime pit spots. I told the guys, nope, we're going to pit here. Nobody's here. Ian got there and saw that we had taken all the good spots. He was pissed off at us <laughs> and we wouldn't move. And everybody kind of got there, all the other, the English lads and they got there. It was like, you know, what's going on here? But, you know, Hey, this is a world team cup. This isn't Cradley versus, you know, Hull. We got here first and these are our spots. And so it kind of really ruffled his feathers, but, I can talk about it these days. It was an ugly night that night because of that. Okay. So to, ju to jump forward with Dan McCormick, um, he, he had offered me a lot. Okay. As, as, as far as, you know, where I was going to live, you know, uh, he hooked me up with Eddie bull a million things. I'm not, I mean, the money was one thing because, you know, it, it certainly is a, a reason that, back in those days that you'll go here or there because we had quite a few choices, mm -hmm. but everything that Dan McCormick had promised me, he came through with flying colors yeah. and I'm not kidding yeah. you that he was such a generous man. And, you know, to this day, I almost think that guy should have been an actor. Oh, you know, really? he was always, you know, very flamboyant and a little bit dramatic, you know, from time to time, but I really liked him. Mm -hmm. I really liked Dan. He's a, he was a great guy. Nigel Wasley, the same in, you know, the, all the, all the Wazleys were just great people to work with. And, um, probably the best thing that ever helped me was getting introduced to Eddie Bull because he was, yeah. Yeah. he was my guy, you know, uh, he actually started out with, with, um, uh, Anders Michnik. And I think he helped Bernie person too, a little mm -hmm. bit but he was pretty much Mitch's guy. And then I came in and Mitch had left. So uh, I was, I, I was with Eddie and we spent a lot of great nights together and uh, his family, you know, Betty Bull and Carrie Bull. Um, 
great family. I, I, I truly miss seeing them. Uh, you know, of course, Betty passed away, but yeah, yeah it was uh, good times for me. Great people. Yeah, and of course, and once you started winning meetings, everyone wanted to know who was probably doing your engines and things like that. And everybody they said, who's Eddie Bull? You know, nobody sort of probably really <laughs> heard of him, you know, and things like that. Yeah. So was that the sort of time then you went from, like, your, your Jawas to your Weslakes? And was that a similar sort of transition period then? So uh, I went to Wesley's, uh because I, I, I started over there, you know, on my, uh, on my Jawa, and I struggled the first couple meetings and i was uh i was talking to cribby mm. it's a funny story <laughs> and i and i and I, I asked cribby i says hey bruce would you mind if i try your westlake i hadn't ridden a westlake at that time at all yeah well, there was a couple roaming around california but i was riding the neil street mm. i went from the two to the two valve to the neil to the streety conversion i loved it especially on the small tracks so, because everybody said, you're struggling on these Jawas, you need to ride a Wesley. Okay. So I said to Bruce Cribb, hey, do you mind if I ride, you know, try your Westlake and do a couple laps after the meeting? He says to me, he goes, you know, I think it'd be okay, but I, I just don't think you're good enough to ride it right yet. I said, well, I'll be careful. I'm thinking he's telling me that he thinks I'm going to crash on it because I was a little bit crazy, you know. But he says, you're not good enough to ride it yet. Ooh. So he did allow me to ride it. And of course, instantly I, I turned over to Westlakes. Yeah. The best thing I ever did. Yeah. Well, obviously yeah. It, it proves in your schools, you know, and your results that it was the best career move of, at that time, you know, things yeah. like that. But if you, if you carried on riding after 82, do you reckon you would have gone to maybe like a GM after Westlake then maybe? Cause obviously they were just breaking through and things like that. Well, you just have to kind of go with what's, what's happening and you know uh even with the wesley there was the garden yeah i mean hans nilsson was riding garden which was good okay what was good for me it was the wesley mm. so you know i would and i was contracted with westlake you know so i you know i had to but you know it was only a yearly contract if things okay. didn't go well at the end of that year maybe there's a chance to uh, to try a gm absolutely i would have because mm. You know, we need to stay with the times and obviously look at them now. They're late. The motors are laid down and they're GMs and, you know, they're they're fantastic, you know, motors and machines. So I probably would have. That's how I went from the Jawa to the Wesley because it was a transition that needed to be done in my eyes. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, everything changes in Speedway. You know, nothing stays the same for so long. Like you say, got muck rights to laydowns, you know, and things like that. You know, and of course now they go insanely quick. You know, it's, it is crazy. Yeah, yeah. But um, my own riding experience is I managed to ride the uh, the GTR, the Mercer Gerhard engine. And mm -hmm. um, it was one of the, the nicest and smoothest uh, engines to ride, it was. But so the only problem with me is that it didn't quite suit how I rode. I went back to the GM and it, and it suited me, you know, and things like that. Right. So, so I'm, I, you know, I went from, when I started my racing career, I went from a Jawa to a GM to a GTR back to a GM. So, you know, like you said, it's whatever suits you. And, of course, the Westlake was your, your dream child, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, you know, it sounds like you're moving around a little bit on all those motors. Yeah, well, it's always, it's always, well, when things started coming out and people started beating me on on the GTR and things like that, I thought, well, I've got to try it at least, and it's and it suited me because I was doing second halves at Peterborough, and um, mm. the GM was good, but then someone started kicking my ass on the GTR, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to get one of these to try it. So I finished yeah. off on the GM one year, and then I went to the GTR and I practiced on it and raced on it, and it just didn't really suit me for some well, whatever reason. So I went back to the GM and I stuck with the GM until i stopped riding so you know i know what you mean by chopping and changing you know you gotta find something <laughs> that works you gotta find something you like you know what's what's also uh is you know what the riders these days call different setups yeah. right yes they have the front ends now the springer front ends and you know the lay downs and all all the above the setups that we would change would be cams for the different size tracks, pistons, mm. you know, uh, we couldn't do anything to the front ends. I even probably moved my, my motor back a half an inch one time 
tried a little a little bit of that, but it never worked. Frames, we tried different frames from PJ, and then I had to run the Westlake frame because I was contracted. But now I hear about all these different setups. You know, it's a little bit confusing for my simple little mind, you know. <laughs> well, obviously, back in when you were riding, it was a bit more simpler times. You know, it was uh, yeah. not too technical. So you just got on the thing right. and rode it. <laughs> right, right. Leave, leave the engine side to Eddie. He knew what he was doing. You know, just yep. and sort of watch what he's yep. doing. Yeah. But, he just uh, told me to get on and ride it. Flat you out. know, get on and ride it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but obviously, looking further, a bit further on in your career, it wasn't too long until you started getting on to sort of like uh, the, the World Pairs final, I think you made, wasn't it, in 1979? Um, when I think, wasn't it your partner didn't turn up? He got stuck at the airport or something and you had to have a reserve ride with you, wasn't it? Was oh, like God, that was such a night. Nice... Well, Kelly Moran got hurt. Mm. two nights before that and the way the ama did it and the team manager was the top two the top two guys in points yes and yes. kelly and i were the top two guys in in the points at that time but kelly got hurt so i'd already flown over mm. you know and i was okay what are we going to do now so we got on the phone uh we tried to get up, get a hold of uh, Autry, and that he wasn't available because he was the next guy in line. Uh, and after that, I think it was Steve Gresham. He had an incident going to the airport. Bobby Schwartz was at a different meeting already. I mean, it was a nightmare. Yeah. So yeah, so I had to ride that the world best pairs by myself that night. You know, I had a good night. Mm. I had a, I had a great night, but you know, it wasn't enough to win the world single pair championship, if you wanted to call it for me. Well, that wasn't the first one. The world first ever world single pairs champion. That would yeah, have been, that yeah. Would have been kind of cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, right. I've, got, I've got that meeting on DVD, you know, um, and things like that. And I think, well, didn't it get rained off on the Saturday and it got run on the Sunday or something like that because it was voyance. Yeah, you know? in voyance, it, it rained at voyance all the time. I love that track, though. Mm. I love that track, you know. Yeah, because obviously a couple of years later you had success in the Intercontinental Final there because you won it in in the rain after uh, and the death. Masters. I won the Masters, the Masters as well. Yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah I forgot about because oh, that's when you won on um, on any Sunday, wasn't it? That that was that's right. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See, I told you I'm a source of knowledge. I know me stuff. <laughs> I'm 63 years old. I can't even believe I remember this still. So hey. Yeah, give me good. a little credit here. Oh, I'll give you, I'll give you loads of credit. I'll give you loads of credit. <laughs> and plus, I bumped my head a few times. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I think everyone's bumped their head a few times. <laughs> but um, what was it like then being on uh, like on any on any any Sunday? Was it um, good? Was it good fun to do? It was. Um, it was great. Uh, you know, Bruce Brown was not the producer anymore who did on any Sunday which to this day is still a huge success. Uh, I was able to, to do it with Kenny Roberts and Brad Lackey, I think, you know, on any Sunday too. And they're great people. Uh, you know, I, I love being a part of it. And um, I was very fortunate that they asked me, uh, but it, it was cool. And they used uh, Alan Seymour was my main guy. He was actually my team manager back in the U.S. too mm. that, uh, you know, got me involved with it. And they, they made sure they used footage from Europe. And so, it, yeah, I, I really enjoyed being a part of On Any Sunday too. It was great. Yeah, because watching it, I also um, had the mixture of obviously USA racing and obviously the meeting from Voyans and things like that. I still find it funny how they said that So when you broke the tapes, they sent you home. You know, I found that funny when they when they said that. I thought, no, that's not true. Sure, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, it was a little exaggerated. Uh, but it was, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's TV, right? Yeah, very much. So. Uh, no, they they send you back to the pits. You know, mm -hmm. um, back in those days, you could bump the tapes. You know, you've seen that. You yeah. know, yeah. Hans Nelson, Ivan, they were probably the kings of bumping the tapes. Michael Lee, mm -hmm. right? And uh, but nowadays you can't move. You know, we could move a little bit. Back in those days, yeah. I like the new yeah. way. I like it now way better. Sit there. Don't touch the tapes. 
Yeah, that, that's fair yeah, enough. I mean, I think fair, I've, I've heard different yeah. opinions on that one because I think, I can't remember who it was who I chatted to. They said, oh, I'd love to have been in the time where you could actually touch the tapes. I reckon, so they said they could make better starts probably then, you know, and things like that. But if you had someone yeah. like, like Ivan who seemed like ages at the start and just kept rolling backwards and forwards, backwards <laughs> and forwards, I can imagine you just there going, come on, any second now, go, go, sort of thing. It used to piss me off. It's like, dude, just get up here and sit still. Let's get this <laughs> race on. Where Because it, it was mental for him. Yeah against us other riders you know mm. but um you just have to focus all that out of there and you're concentrating on on you know on the tapes is what you're thinking about you know not yeah. i have back and forth and back and forth and bumping them and uh, yeah 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 but yeah. still i mean it must have been a great experience just to ride against that sort of that, that guy who could mentally sort of rock your boat a little bit without you even realizing yeah, and how much we could learn from them, even in the pits. Mm. I mean, the mental aspect of Speedway, that's where you pick it up from those history-making, you know, racers, Ole, Ivan, mm. you know, and even Michnik, because I, I rode with Anders quite a bit too, talking about a guy that never smiles hardly ever. Unless, <laughs> unless he used to see a girl, he just always wink at him. Oh, you know, right, okay. <laughs> I was rich. He'd, he'd, he'd this straight face, and he just wink at him like didn't really have a tough time finding women either, did he? You know, so no, I, think it, I think he speedway did the talking for that, so he was right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but just moving on to sort of like your world championship sort of road and things like that. Um, before you even made your fight, the debut in 1980, um, did you, wasn't it uh, a story that I think I read in your book or, or I read somewhere that you helped Peter Collins in 79 at Katowice? Did you loan, loan him an engine or something like that? Or was it a bike or something? I, I think I've read somewhere. Was that? Uh, Kelly? I'm uh, sorry, Neil. I, I, I thought it was Peter Collins you helped out. Was it PC you helped out? Or was it or was it Kelly that year? I can't remember. Because I think I've read somewhere <laughs> that, it, that you helped one of the boys out in the final, I think. I could be wrong. <laughs> It had to have been Kelly. Oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. In fact, at the very end of our career, I, I built a bike that went to the World Team Cup or pairs or any of the test matches mm -hmm. specifically for Kelly because his bikes are so bad, <laughs> you know. And so we always had one for Kelly, mm. you know. And, and he – the good thing is, is Kelly could get on – on a different bike right away because he was so talented and just pick up on it within a second. But I, I didn't loan PC anything. I don't think he oh, was okay. really set. He knew what he, it, it was Kelly. Mm. Yeah. Cause I, I remember reading that somewhere that you helped someone out, but I couldn't remember who it was, but, um, but yeah, but then obviously moving on to your own individual career, you had a good um, run, I think in 1980, uh, you managed to almost win. I think it was the intercontinental final at White City. You just, Chris Morton just pipped you on the line, I think, in the runoff or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah. Another great rider from the back. Yes. Was Chris. You know, he he was great. Um, yeah, I mean, I had to – gosh, I think um, my point average, too, in 80 was 11 points, I think, out of 12. And mm -hmm. I had a great year. And then, you know, my – my uh, overseas final was great, intercontinental final. Yeah, they were great meetings. I don't remember a whole lot of those meetings, especially when you get beat. You know, you try to forget about that. But yeah. Chris was fantastic, you know, and he was really good around White City. I loved White City. Mm. Um, you know, as was Kenny Carter. He was pretty fast around there, too. Mike Lee was phenomenal. So, yeah, it, those are good times, you know. It was, it was tough getting into the eighty. World final. The biggest problem for me was the qualifiers, like in 1979 in America. Mm. You know, only two guys went out of the American final mm. that that then went on to the overseas intercontinental final, and it was so difficult because the talent that we have, yeah. we had, yeah. and and the different tracks that we had to ride because they really had to be long tracks, FIM compatible. So there are always one-off tracks like Santa Ana was one-off, LA Coliseum before the world final uh, and even after me, Long Beach. But uh, it, it was so difficult. And, you know, even in, in a world final, you can't make any mistakes. You can't make one mistake 
to get either first or second in the qualifying in the American finals. That is, it mm -hmm. was tough. And I didn't get out that first year. I think that was at Santa Ana. It was tough. Yeah. I can imagine they were tough because obviously again, the field was a big field. So obviously you had, like you said, Sean Moran, Kenny Moran, you had uh, Brad Oxley um, mm -hmm. and people like that. And all these to us unknown Americans who just did well in America, you know, it wasn't yeah. uh, and things like that. So yeah, I mean, all, all the qualifiers, it was like a big old Grand Prix series like it is nowadays and things like that. Sure is. Yeah, but a uh, lot less. Yes. We had three. We had yes. American final overseas and intercontinental. And then, of course, the world final, which was everything. But yes, you're right. Yeah. Th those qualifiers were tough. Yeah. Because wasn't some of the American finals held like the previous year for the following year's world championship in those sort of days? Or was it all done in the well, same year? Only, we only had one world final that was at the LA Coliseum. And yes, there was an American final at the Coliseum. Okay. Different track altogether mm -hmm. because it was a one-off and they had to get that track in and out because they had a football season there. They had college football there. And so they had to show the FIM that they could do that. And then of course, uh, excuse me, it was the, the national championship was there that was to show the FIM the world final, that they could do a world final with the, the FIM specs. So, yeah, it, it was like Santa Ana College or something like that. The stadium there was the first one in 79 and very slick and tough to ride. You had to get out of the start, very narrow. And that's the one where I didn't get out of. You know, that, that was a tough one. But the other ones I was able to get out of, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, tough though. Oh yeah, I can imagine how tough. It's same with the British finals over here. They were they were tough meetings, and, and top riders went out. Not necessarily the British final, but even the worst at the semi-finals. So you know, and things yeah. Like that. So, but yeah, I mean, those qualifiers were tough and everything. But then to get to the 1980 World Final, you know, you must have been the dream come true for yourself. You, no, it, it was. But I'll tell you what, and you know this, Neil. What goes through your mind is that am I going to be one of those riders that, you know, is favored to win, but yet never wins. Yeah. It's going through your mind. So, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're fighting so hard to think and concentrate and not make mistakes and do the right thing. And it's just, it's this big 10 piece puzzle mm. and you have to connect every single one of those pieces of the puzzle together to become a champion you could be missing one of those pieces of that puzzle and you'd never win a championship like Dave Jessup. In oh, my nice. eyes, in my eyes, I think he should have been a world champion. Mm. Uh, I, I really do. But on those big nights, carburetor, carburetor would fall off or he'd have little incidences, you know? So that for me going into the 80 final was, I want this. This is all I want, you know? And I was favored. I had a great average that year. I had a great season. I had my qualifiers were, were really good and I made a couple of mistakes. The biggest mistake I made there was that was the year that we went from side mount carburetors to center mount. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I felt, I felt very conservative. I'm going to keep my side mount. I'm going to stay on the, my side mount tonight. It flexes a little bit more. This tracks a little bit slick. I'm going to stay with my side mount. And I, well, besides my riding, I think that was one of my biggest mistakes. I, I had center mounts in the pits, but I made a decision on practice day. This is hooking up better. I'm going to stay with my center mount. I mean, my side mount. So Wrong so, decision. Yeah, well, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But then it right. probably made you that bit more uh, so say positive and focused for winning at Wembley in 81. Wow. What a, yeah. It's, you know... I mean, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not lying about this. I remember those heats like they happened two days ago. Yeah, can imagine. The, the heat with Ole and myself, I mean, I've already said this. He's got eyes in the back of his head. He knew where I was at every single solitary moment. I could not drift out an extra, an extra foot and cost me three bike lengths. Mm. I had to stay right there. And then I remember going down the back straightaway trying to come underneath them. And I literally rubbed his rear wheel with my front wheel twice, hoping that he was going to move out. And he did. Mm -hmm. And I followed him and we both lifted at the same time. So I lost a little concentration. I should have kept, you know, hit him there. And I saw, I should have turned it hard, but I, I kept my eye on him, watched him and we both went out. So 
I'll never forget that night. And, you know, when I went to the 1976 world final as a spectator, that was what truly changed my mind in the way of speedway. Mm. It was the, the atmosphere was just amazing. And on the scarves and the horns, and we weren't used to that in America, you know, we saw a lot of beer drinking. Yeah, we saw a lot of pretty girls in the stands. Don't get me wrong, but they're they're so hardcore, the English and European spectators and supporters, that uh, that night at Wembley Stadium, it truly came out. I think there was, there was a whole bunch of supporters that didn't like me too because I rode for a different team. But because the meeting was so good and I had a good meeting, they actually kind of came onto my side at the end of the night, which was kind of great, but. It was uh, obviously one of the best nights of my life. Yeah, and that race between yeah. you and Ollie, you know, that, that is just one awesome race to watch, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've seen that since I was like three, four years old because my dad's got it on uh, old videotape, things like that. And I yeah. think I wore the tape out by watching like world final races like that, you know. I mean, everyone says it's the greatest world final. I mean, it's a great, good world final because of your two good races. But I think the whole night was a bit, wasn't the best final, I, I reckon you would ever right. say. But then again, I think you, you were lucky almost in one respect because you had a certain Mr. Gunderson having a bit of a mechanical problem. If I reckon if he didn't have that mechanical problem, you might have had him on your, on your toes a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, absolutely, it's the best world final ever. Oh, right? you are, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I've seen some really good, especially some of the GP finals that are amazing. Uh, and, and, yeah, it, I mean, even with Tommy, my, my heat with Tommy was um, – was incredible. I made a mistake. I mean, I came, I made the start. I didn't make the start, but I was with him. He came out and I, and I, I kind of left the door open for him to come underneath me. So those are the little mistakes you don't want to make no. that particular night. It made it a great night for the fans. And of course me too, mm. don't get me wrong, but I can, one of the things that, that I'll never forget, I'm, I'm in the pits and all of my heats were done. I had, I had Kenny in the last heat, and, you know, we had at that time had some issues and Peter comes up to me, Peter Collins and says, Hey, don't do anything stupid. You need to get third or better. You can throw everything away right here. If you do something stupid, because Kenny's not going to care. He wants to win that heat. And if he's got to take you out, he will. And of course I looked at him like, you know, I've just won my last four heats. I'm going to beat his ass. And so I started thinking about it going, you know, he's so right. Stay the heck away from him mm. and just do your thing and be complacent, but stay up there. I'll never forget that. And remember, that was back in 1981. Uh, but like I said, PC was such a good mate of mine. And I'll never forget him telling me that because the youngster that I was and how bad I wanted to win every heat you know, sometimes got me into trouble, mm. but I really thought about what he told me literally a couple minutes before I got on the motorcycle to go out there. And it really did help. I can imagine it was one of the hardest races because it must be one of the longest races you ever did in your career. Just sitting behind someone, you're thinking, should I go for it? Should I go for it? Okay, you're thinking about what PC said. Then of course you hear everything rattling, everything shaking. You feel every single vibration. And you think yeah. it's like you, you're riding for like an hour. And really it's only obviously a minute, but it's like an hour long race because it's just so long. Yeah. And the other thing that I did too, Neil, mm. is in my last heat, you know, sometimes we have a, a way of overthinking crap, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. so I said, okay, it's my last heat. I've had really great four heats on that bike. Let's go to the spare. Mm. I felt as if there was a little metallic -y look in the, in the oil, because remember it was total oil loss system back yeah. in those days. Yeah. We're not going to take any chances. We're going to ride that. It's just like this other bike. And then he goes, it's fine, mate. Nope. We're going to do this. And of mm. course, after the world final, he had the motor port uh, apart later and it was perfectly fine, but I was kind of overthinking it, but I was being very, very cautious and conservative, you know, that last race. Yeah. 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 Cause obviously that's the huge prize on the line. You know, you don't want to take any chances, you know, cause uh, right. like, like, like PC said, if you ran a last, you would have been sort of buggered really, wouldn't you? So yeah. Um, and it, uh, didn't Tommy and Ollie finish on 12, wasn't it that night as well? Wasn't it, Dave? Yes, they did. Yeah, so you would have had a three-man runoff 
and that's not yeah. what you wanted. <laughs> yeah, no, no, especially when you only had to get third or better, you know. And and I had Jerry Stansel in that race, and you know Kenny, and um, gosh, I, I can't remember who else, but it it was my most mellow heat of the night. So I couldn't have asked for more in that last heat, you know. But I remember getting out of the start and letting Ke Kenny go. And, and I was looking behind me because, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to come jamming underneath me. I felt so conservative riding so mellow on the, on that last heat because I didn't want to make mistakes, but I was concerned. Somebody going to freaking take me out or what, you know, all these things go through your mind, play mind yeah. games with you. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Speedway's yeah. a mind game sport anyway, you know, and it, it right. like that, you know, but um, yeah. And I mean, obviously then I've seen the photos, I've seen the reaction from the crowd, every loving you, kissing you everywhere, <laughs> you know, all the girls around you, you know, no, no surprise there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I love that more than anything. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we all do. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's just great to hear because obviously it was a, it was a huge night. And obviously nobody knew at that sort of time that that, was going to be sort of like the last world final at Wembley, you know, and, and, and yeah. things like that. But um, how was Wembley to ride as a track? Was it a good track to ride for a world final? Len Silver did the track, mm. you know, he was, he did the track that night. I mean, Neil, I'm going to tell you it was perfect, right? Oh, I mean, hey, I was, <laughs> I was fortunate because there was a little grip out there for me. Mm. You know, where a lot, of, yeah, back in those days, there was grip on tracks, you know, here and there, but there was also a lot of really slick tracks. Mm. And so I was fortunate. I didn't have to go way out and search for that grip because that's just bike lengths, you know? So I felt as if the track was perfect for me. Obviously, I'm going to say that, but I didn't have any issues with it whatsoever. It was great. Yeah, I can imagine yeah, so. It was, it was very, very much a, a level playing field sort of track, really, because, again, it was a man-made track, you know, and things like that. You know, I've seen footage right. of um, yourself doing practice at, at Wembley, you know, and things like that. And, I mean, it must have been amazing to do it, even without a crowd there. You know, it must have been a, a very good experience. You know, um, it's, it's funny you say that because we're so focused – you know, and yeah, it's practice day and we got, we've got to get our set up and we've got to choose the right bike and make the right decision. So I didn't really think of all that at the time. You know, what blew my mind is when I entered the stadium and I actually, we were there pretty early, but I came out of the, out of the changing room and went out to look at the track and there was already, you know, 95% of the fans in this, in the stands. Mm. And the horn started going off. Oh, the, the 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 back of my neck, the hair stood up like it gave me such chills. I'm going, wow. You know, remember back in those days, there wasn't a lot of stadiums really enclosed like that. Mm. Nor was there a hundred thousand people there. Yeah. So and and you know, the the horns and the scarves and they loved their speedway that, you know, and a world final is, it was amazing to me. Even Gothenburg the year before didn't, it was, it was really great atmosphere. Wasn't anything like Wembley. Neither was the Coliseum in 1981. In my, in my eyes, Wembley obviously was the best atmosphere I had ever witnessed in my life. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, the fans going crazy. And the closest I've ever got to that is obviously going to Cardiff. You know, going to Cardiff, yeah. you know, it's the closest I'm ever going to get to watching um, a, a meeting in that sort of stadium. And the atmosphere at Cardiff, and I mean, I know it's not full capacity, but still, it's a real bloody noisy place <laughs> to be on a, on a Saturday. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, Han Greg, Han Greg Hancock told me that Cardiff was awesome to be at. And, you know, I always want to go there and watch a GP. I'm, 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 that's the next place I want to go to to watch one of the GPs. I was fortunate, fortunate enough to go out to, uh, to Poland and watch Torin. Mm. And um, about six years ago, that was pretty cool. I went out with Monster and, and got to watch that. Met Ty Wuffington in the mm. pits. You know, it was really cool. Saw Plecky up in the stands. It was, it was great. Good for me, yeah. Yeah, all, all these young, all, all young, these, uh, young whippersnappers, you know, trying to do what you did, you know, things like that. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I mean, Greg, you know, I, I, I got to know Greg a little bit towards the end of his career. Um, I helped out Wilbur a, a bit when I went over to Sweden a couple of times and things like that. Um, and I mean, 
Greg's an idol to me anyway, you know, but to actually chat to the guy, you know, and obviously now yeah. talking, to, talking to you, I can see where he gets all his good mannerisms from, you know, from your, from his mentor and things like that. You know, I, it's, it's one thing to be a, a sensational speedway rider or racer of any type, but to be that way to the fans and the people in general, personality means everything to me. And, uh, you know, Greg is one of the world's best with people. He is such a great guy. And, you know, I've known him since he was just a little lad and, you know, I, and uh, he's, and to win all those world championships, you know, he's America's best by far, but apart from his racing, the way he treats people in my eyes is, you know, five stars for sure. Yeah. And exactly how I got taught to look after the fans, uh, respect them and everything else. Okay. They can boo you. They can chart on you. But then at the end of the day, I could still buy you a boo in the bar sort of thing, you know, cause they could still love you yeah. after that, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, going back to your career before we talk a bit more about Greg, um, I've got a bit of footage here. Hopefully it's going to work, um, of you from nine, from the 1981 year. Um, it's you doing the, is it the Thames Sport Riders Championship at, um, uh, at Hackney, I think it is. So, oh, yeah. That, that's I, at Hackney, yep. Yeah, that's at Hackney. So I've got a bit of footage here. I don't know if you want to sort of like maybe just sort of talk about it. Hopefully it's coming to you all, all good and fine um, and, and things like that. But, uh, yeah, there's you on gate number one. So what were your sort, of, yeah, sort of memories of riding at sort of like these places like Hackney and stuff like that? All good stuff? I always liked Hackney a lot. You know, that was Len Silver's track, and it was good, and, and that was a televised event actually there. And um, it, it was one of the bigger money money open meetings too. See, I was rolling a little bit there, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh, yeah, made a, a good start. But see, I'm on the slick right there. You know, I should have probably moved up a little bit. Is that Malcolm Simmons out there? Yeah, that's Simo yeah. in front. Simo, he he was really great. He was a hard guy to pass. Mm. So yeah, so I just got some good drive coming underneath him right there. He's still. Out in that grippy area, though, you know, that's where I want to be. Yeah. You know? There you go, leg back, straight into the dirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I always liked it. I, you know, I had a hard time hooking up in the slick, always, you know? Yeah. I really did. Yeah. But just showing, yeah, oh, there goes some wheelies there, you know, straight away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is, yeah. I, I hope we're not going to talk about the wheelies I did at, at the Intercontinental Final, too. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got a bit of footage of that, but we can always skip over that. But it's, no, I'm teasing. It's, that was my bad. I was an mm. idiot for doing that. I've said that all along, and I it was so stupid. But yeah, you know, and we kind of the wheelies thing just kind of started back in those days, and some of the riders didn't like it because they thought we were, you know, pushing mud in their face, you know. Yeah. But it was really for entertainment purposes. You know, we mm. were trying to give the, the crowd a good show. And, <laughs> and I was kind of being an idiot there. Like I hooked up one time and Simo was looking at me like, you're an idiot. You know, yeah. Yeah. But, I just got a lot of everything. But no, I just thought I'd show you that because that's uh, one of those sort of meetings that, um, you know, was a, it was a bit of fun. Obviously, it was, let's say, the first sort of live Speedway meeting on TV in London anyway and things like that. Yeah. You know, it's the funny yep. things you come across and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it just proves that that 81 year was your year because you're winning a second half event like that, like a country mile. Yeah, I still have that Thames trophy in my uh, tro trophy collection at home. I love that. It's a big square, like, clear, yeah. bitching yeah. little tube. It's really cool. Yeah, a great yeah, meeting. Yeah. Great time. Yeah, very much a great time. Again, I always say that the 80s, even though it went downhill towards the end of the 80s, that sort of end of the 70s, early 80s was a good time in British Speedway. So much Speedway going on, so many top stars there, right. things like that. You know, but um, moving on to um, a bit later on in, your, in well, 82, shall we say, we move on to that now. Um, was you always going to go back to Crady then, no matter what, um, in your British career? Oh, without a doubt. I never even once would consider going to another club. I know that I had some negotiation problems right around or right after the 81, uh, world championship, uh, had a new manager. And of course, you know, when you win the world championship, all of a sudden your pay rate goes way up. I, I was there really to win more, but having managers, they, you have to listen to what they say. And, 
And so uh, I had to hold out for a little bit, but uh, Cradley came good. Um, a, a lot of the issues were we had so much racing for the USA, world team, world pairs, test matches, but we also had to make trips back to California mm -hmm. to ride twice a year, which took me away from Cradley. And they didn't so much like that. And I understood it, but remember I'm, I was Californian and I was still trying to do what I could to help California Speedway. And that's where I grew up. So those were issues back in the day, but everybody worked through them yep. and uh, we were all happy in the end. Yeah. But I would never have gone to a, a, a different um, track. Cradley was my home. Mm. Yeah. And it's good that you can stay loyal to that one club, you know, and obviously great, yeah. great supporters and things like that, especially those, those small little matches you had against Coventry. You know, they, they were slightly good. I think, you know, back in those days. And Wolverhampton, oh, and Wolverhampton right? Yep, yep. Oh yeah, the Wolves and and the Bees and us. It was really good rivalry, rivalry around there. Same with Leicester; they were pretty close, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but those were those were tense. They oh, were God. more tense because of the supporters. Yeah, because you know all the riders, they all we all got along. Yeah, we wanted to win and we wanted to win for our team. But the supporters, man, they were tough those nights. Yeah, I can imagine. I've seen I've seen videos of like the stands being packed for Cradley meetings and things like that. Um, especially when you had like likes of yourself, Ollie, Tommy, um, who else would have been there? Sort of like Phil Collins, Eric Gunderson, you know, and then later on Mitch Shearer on the bees. Yeah, yeah, you know, there, yeah, yeah. Schwartzy, Gunda the Wonder, <laughs> uh, uh, Price Bro, the, uh, Alan Graham. Mm. And basketball from time to time. Yeah, those are good yeah. days, man. Yeah, we just, just wish we could have those sort of days back again. Man. It's like sort of crowds and everything else. But we could still look at it on YouTube. We're all good. So, <laughs> that's the main yeah, thing. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, back in the day when I was in California, the only place to become world champion was to live in, in the UK and race British Speedway in the yeah. British League. British League, they, don't even, they haven't called it British League in I don't know how long, right? Yeah. But yeah. that was a place. If you want to become champion, you have to send yourself to Britain. Yeah. Because there were so many different size tracks. All the best riders were there. All the European riders came to Britain, you know, and it was a place. It's a place to be. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's a shame that it's still not that. I and mean, Poland have taken over. But then again, you know, it's just times that have changed, really. So, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, you never know one day England might come back to, to, to rule the roost, shall we say, again, you know, things like that. Yeah. You know, Speedway always goes through, like, peaks and valleys. It's in a pretty deep valley right now, but I'm hoping that it's going to come back, including Britain, because... I just remember what it was like when I was there and I want to see that again for all the rest of the riders, you know? Oh yeah. 100%. We could make great, we could make great livings back in those days. Mm. Yeah. You know, Did you actually get like, before you became world champion, was your sponsorship good then? You managed to get lots of sponsors and stuff like that to help you out at that sort of time. I had, I had great sponsors, you know, mm. from sportswear, you know, you know, offshore sportswear to Bell Ray, you know, Bell Helmets back in those days. It, it, and then, and then even, you know, Interspan and, and, you know, NEB Clutches, Westlake, you know, was the factory guy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a small factory, Westlake was back then, but I mean, it was a, it was a great deal for me. And in, even in my last year, Ole had taken over all the Westlake. It was then, then called World Champion Westlake. And I was, I remember going to, you know, to meet up with him and they gave me my first time, like seven full complete bikes. And that was a lot back in those days, you know, really was. Yeah. I can imagine it was, but obviously it wasn't like it is now where you had like two in Poland, Sweden and Poland, you know, and then obviously two in it, two or three in England, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a bit different to what it was now, but it's, it's still awesome. Yeah. That sort of thing though. Well, I had, I had my, my English bikes and then, I had American bikes, which were totally different. I didn't have anything in Aussie because I was so far away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I had my long track stuff with a, a, a great friend of mine that has since passed, Ty, uh, uh, Jürgen Goldstein. He was great. So he kept my stuff there. But 
even a speedway bike or two. But whenever it was a World Team Cup and it was close to Germany, we always brought our A1 stuff into that, and I wouldn't ride that. Mm -hmm. Those are really for open meetings, and and my long track stuff was always there because, and they were all the good long track bikes that I had, but I just didn't ride them very well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it just didn't suit your style more than anything. You know, you're used yeah. to the small tracks. It's fine. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I've also got a bit of footage here from um, the, uh, the, the the rivalry, shall we say, with uh, with Cradley. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's heat one of the 82 match you had. It was on TV. Um, you and uh, Ollie having a good little race, I think it was in this one. Um but yeah, I mean, just looking at things like that, like the crowd and things like that, you can see see there for yourself. You know, it's a it's a huge crowd. But obviously, that's the old shape commentary as well. So oh, that's all. Yeah, it's all commentary. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was good everywhere he rode. Yeah, it really was. You know, yeah. and there's you on the outside, obviously. Yeah, yeah. coming out of four in the white. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's uh, San. Is that San Nicolas maybe next year? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then. Uh, oh, yeah. here we go tape tape touching again <laughs> that, that's uh, was that uh, what Collins was that I think I might have been was that Phil I think I'm sorry Phil. it was Phil yeah, yeah. Phyllis yeah yeah I was gonna say but yeah I mean yeah. Look, looking at the right even here it was still hard racing even in the uh, just in the British League match not necessarily just the World Championship yeah see the little bank there coming out of turn four too yeah that, that was a pretty good little bank bank track get up on top of that bank and it was always really slick it it was pretty hard to pass around coventry i remember that especially guys like you know ollie olsen mitch was great around there tommy newton was great around there yeah i'm I mean, I'm trying but it doesn't seem like i'm getting pulling any bike lengths really no i think if you're going to be in heat one as well there's not going to be any dirt out there if we just get you know but, but you're still on his tail you're not, not letting him get yeah out of his yeah See, I'm, st you know, that I'm still getting out in the dirt. Yeah. Well, so, what are you showing these races that I'm losing, Neil? You're I'm, not supposed I'm, to show show the races that I'm losing. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got, I've got a few. Not necessarily you losing. This is the case of the, I'll show you one that you won. So we're, we're one one. They're one loss, one wins. <laughs> I lost it. a lot of races. Trust me. Yeah, I mean. We, I think we've, I think we kind of like we, all us riders have lost silly races in the end and things like that. But um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, great to see this sort of footage and to have you to talk about it as well. You know, just to hear yeah. what you sort of see and things like that. But because um, that was the night, I think was the it was a controversial one. I think last heat decider and Tommy decided to knock you off. You know, and, and then oh, the, and that's the, right, the that's race. right, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I, yeah. I, if, I, I, I had some. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I thought if you stayed down, the race would have been stopped and he would have been excluded. But you've been the ultimate team guy. You got back up and carried on. So Yeah. Yeah. You never know because of the referees, you know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you were, you know, the reason for the restart, you know, and if he didn't see me get hit or whatever, then, you know, hey, I'm the one on the ground. I tried too hard and is what it is sort of thing. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like really – staying on the ground and doing the dramatic thing very much you know if i yeah. fell off i fell off get ready yeah. for the next one yeah you're a proper yeah. racer you know get up and carry on and away you went sort of thing but no but that um, yeah. 82 season obviously um a few controversial moments through the season um and stuff like that but besides a, a, besides, few? a few a few yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but besides all that quite a few so, yeah quite a few besides, besides all those though i mean you know the actual season itself was was pretty good for yourself you know again probably i think it must have been like a, a high 10 11 point average for crazy you know and and things like that but you know i mean unfortunately everyone focuses on the controversy i mean the overseas final up until that last race was a good meeting for you i think you were on like 11 points going into your last race and and, and things yeah. like that so but, but before that obviously kicked off what was your sort of memories of that meeting leading up to that sort of point was it good was it going as a, like a good meeting for yourself uh, which one was that i'm sorry the 82 final the 82 overseas final <laughs> the one at white city oh uh i had a great year Mm. You know, there was there was so much going on with my life because the Chips people had been in touch with us to um, possibly come on the show. And, uh, you know, I was kind of all for it. I'll, I'll try to make a long story short here. So they, they come to me, hey, we'd like you to be a special guest on the show one time. Great. Love to. 
and how they saw me was from all the televised speedway racing back in those days because it was all televised here in the states all the big races were and so yeah i'd love to so then they contacted my manager you know like um maybe a month or two after that and said hey we're thinking about writing a special spot for Bruce in the show as a regular and uh, i i listened to him i, I mean, i'm not a f- freaking actor i'm a racer i don't know what the hell i'm doing mm. that's obviously obvious when i was in the show too right but um so i said okay well you know what do i do next i mean i remember i've got a world championship in like i think literally it was in three and a half months away well we want you to drive to london and start taking some dialogue classes Mm. we'll find a coach there and i'm like in the midlands and i'm thinking oh that's easy right i'm riding 150 nights out of the year you know it's i'm at the top of my game so i've this is my thought process was nothing but racing and hardcore racing and they said, but you're going to have to quit racing tomorrow. Right. And I, my championship was literally three months away at the Coliseum. I already won it in Wembley. First time ever in the United States, the world championship was going to be held. And so I said, no, can't do it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I've got a race for my team for Cradley Heath. I've got all these races lined up. I still, I think, I don't think I had a, a, the intercontinental final. I might've already done that. Maybe not. I might've had that still left. So I, I just, I said, thanks very much. It's okay. We still want you to come on as a special guest when you're done with the season. Great. Thanks very much. Continued on. And like literally three weeks before the world championship, they called me again and said, we've written a part, especially for Bruce on the show, but he definitely has to quit right after the show or right after the world championship that night. And we're going to write the story because they filmed the 82 world final. It was my debut onto the show that he won. I was like, really talk about pressure. It's in my, my home country. It's the second one. And they're going to write the story that I won it. So I said, okay, you know, but I can't quit. I'm going to do a few races here and there because I'm, you know, I'm committed. And so, uh, you know, I I was probably two weeks out and, you know, I'm starting about a lot. I've really accomplished all of my goals and said, you know what, if, if I win this championship, I think I'm going to retire on the podium. If I get second or third, I'm going to probably continue to race a little bit, do a couple races here and there because I had this dream and this vision of, winning the championship and never racing again. Okay. It was a big dream quite a lot to ask of, but so, uh, that night was filled full of controversy as you're well aware of. And, and, uh, my family and everybody was there. And, and so, you know, I, I got up on the podium and I announced my retirement. I, I didn't say anything to Cradley, which I, you know, I, I'm ashamed of, because I'd committed to them and I I made a few enemies by doing that, but I had to look at it this way. This is a chance of my lifetime. I've accomplished my goals. I want to be back home with my family and, you know, I could possibly make a good living out of this. People don't realize if you crash, like we've seen so many of our heroes end up in a wheelchair or passed away, that certainly that does go through your mind. Yeah. And I, I just never wanted that to happen either. So I made the decision of retiring on the podium, and, and that's what I did. And literally a week after I finished, I went directly onto the show and struggled. Let me tell you, I struggled a lot, but I, I loved it. You know, I'm not in the television business anymore, obviously, because I wasn't worth the damn. But um, it was a big and hard decision to make. Mm. 
Yeah, and I mean, uh, it's a decision that you did obviously yeah. took a lot of thought and thinking about, you know, to get to that sort of stage. But I must say one thing about the 82 World Final. That's one nice trophy that you won. That gold world, that gold world championship with an eagle on it. That's one nice trophy, I must admit. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I have that really close to my, my team's trophy too. And uh, I've got a lot of great trophies. My masters, you know, mm. the masters, the masters of speedway was to me in my, in my mind, a full rostrum of the most talented riders because the, it was, they were picked by Oli back mm. in those days. And, you know, it was a real, and it was over like a little GP system. Yeah. I think back in yeah. those days we had four of them. So for me to win the masters that year, it was huge. Of course it was the masters and it wasn't the individual world championship. So nobody else thought of that other than the writers, the writers knew this is, are you kidding? If you can win the masters, you know, you're one of the best in the world or you are. That's what was going through all of our minds because you know, the roster was so big and talented. So um, my master's trophy was huge. My world pairs with Bobby Schwartz in Poland, because that was the first world championship that we won. Um, it all means a great deal to us winning the league with Cradley. I mean, I'm so fortunate and so blessed to have, have had such a great career with Speedway. Uh, I made a few, quite a few mistakes, you know, in my time especially doing those stupid wheelies in the back with the other Yanks in front of me. Um, but, you know, we live and learn and, you know, at least I can face that fact these days that, yeah, I was an idiot a lot. But on the other hand, I did the absolute best that I could possibly do. And I wanted to be great to the people because they were out there supporting me and a ton of other people and spending their own money doing it, you know. Yeah, and I mean, you were just yeah, I mean, doing your thing, you know, you were thoroughly enjoying it, you know, you've, you retired literally at the peak of your career on top of the world, you know, you said bye-bye to it, even though you probably wished that you could just see the season out, you know, more than anything, but that's probably one, maybe one thing that sort of bugs you maybe looking back is that you couldn't finish the season, you know, maybe if you finished the season, you might have felt better going into chips. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, but I wouldn't have had that opportunity in TV, you know, uh, and I, I, I never said I was, I wanted to be four time world champion or three time world champion. Um, and like I said, I didn't want to be away from home anymore. You know, I, I, I lived in Britain and I, I, I loved it. Don't get me wrong, but I needed to be back home with my family. And, you know, a, a big thing to me was also having my own family. You know, mm. I look at some of these guys, Neil, like Autry. I remember going to Wimbledon and seeing, you know, Jet, his little baby in, in the crib. And it's hard enough for us to focus, you know, 100% of the time. But having to go to the meeting and knowing you have little ones there, too, I can't even imagine that. I never had to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I had a lot of girlfriends, but I didn't have any kids back in those days. And that's a huge responsibility because of the risk that's involved with Speedway. Mm -hmm. And I used to admire guys like Autry and all these other dads that put their lives on the line every single solitary day mm -hmm. because this is what they wanted to do. And yes, this is their livelihood. Yeah. But that was quite yeah. tough for them to do that. Yeah, because it's that extra distraction sort of thing in the, in the pits and things like that, unfortunately. But, uh, I mean, off the speedway, you mean, say you had a good, yep. good career in the movies and things like that. So you can't be, you can't grow up it too much. Well, I don't know about a good career in movies. I did a lot of low budget ones. That's true. I, I'm, you know what? I can't complain. You know, I, I really can't. I had a blast in it and everybody took good care of me and I had a great time. And, um, you know, after that, I realized that. I wasn't going to make a good living and I had kids. I did not want to be away from my kids two months at a time when I had to go shoot a movie. Mm. And so that's why I got back into the, the, the industry that I've been involved with, with my family since 1957, you know? Yeah. So I, I, 
I think I made a great decision. Our company's doing great. We've had a lot of uh, a lot of problems, you know, losing my youngest son and uh, getting hit by a drunk driver is dev devastating for our entire family. And every day, it's um, is a tough day. Um, but we think he's looking down on us and taking good care of us. You know, it's it's uh, the, the the worst times of our lives for my wife and my other kids and my family. Yeah, and obviously what happened to Connor was absolutely awful. I mean, I read yeah, about it over here and things like that, you know. It was, but like you said, he's shining down on you, you know, things like that. And when Kelly does the um, Connor Cup and things like that, you know, it must bring a nice little smile to your face and things like that to know that he's been remembered this way. It, it really does. You know, Kelly Inman does a great job with the Connor Cup. You know, we have a lot of great, uh, you know, um, partners in that. Uh, it's literally the next largest race in California, apart from the, the uh, national championship, mm. we raise a lot of money for the riders. We think, uh, you know, we put a lot of good money up for them and we uh, really draw a huge awareness to drunk drivers. You know, mm. it's a, a big part of our lives now. So, you know, that's the main thing. If we can get, you know, the message across to some of these people and that saves alive then we've uh we've done a, a good job with that i'd be pleased to know kelly gave me uh, a connor, a connor cup t-shirt when i came over one of the first gifts he gave me was one of those and i thought oh mate I've, i'm in the club now you know, <laughs> you know no, that's, cool. like that. yes, that's you really are. cool you know it's really cool yes, to have. You are. and obviously he um and obviously yeah. your, your company's colors are my favorite color green a bit like wiggy and things yeah. like that you know it's <laughs> kind of cool yeah but, you know uh, what I, I don't mean to change subject but um, I talk about all these heroes of mine, you know, in Speedway, and I always forget to talk about Wiggy. Yes. And I got to tell you, and I'm serious, I think he was always one step ahead of the game with all of his leathers, with his, his just his whole well being, you know. I mean, I look back at that these days, you know, I, heard, I think didn't even have a one of the first guys that had a spoiler on the front wheel too, yeah. maybe, you know, yeah, and yeah. he was he was yeah. very uh, flamboyant and I, I love that. And of course such a great, great guy. Yeah, because obviously he had all aerodynamics on the long track and things like that. Because obviously the long track was his thing, you know, and stuff like that. He was good yeah. at speedway, but I think the long track was his baby, really, more than anything. Um, it's such a shame, yeah. that obviously. Yeah. I think if Wiggy was still here, he would be doing so much for the youth of British Speedway, both on the grass and the speedway. It's such a such shame that yeah. he can't do it. He's not here. I know. I know. That's, you know, we're seeing a lot of this. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to show you Connor's little junior bike right okay, here behind cool. me. It's in my office. You see it back there? Oh, that's very nice. I like that. That's cool. That's a two stroke Kawasaki. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, he rode that. And those, those are his leathers back there too. Oh, that's they so had. awesome. They're awesome. I've got those in my office here. I like it. Yeah. 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 Thought I'd show you that. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. I, I just get to see when you, when you come out for the, the um, Connor Cup. It's obviously on display there, so I get to see it on the live stream in the industry. But to see it in your office, it looks a lot better than I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it fits perfect in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see your, your office is made to fit around the bike. You know, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> but didn't I see um, a little while back on your Instagram that you've uh, restored your long track bike? You how wasn't it you you've got and things like that now? I uh, okay, so uh, I restored my long track bike that I got from PC when I went back for the funeral. Mm. He takes me in his garage. He set it aside on purpose. He got it from Andy Reid, I think, right around nineteen. 89 or so mm -hmm. okay he andy reed says yeah i'm not gonna ride it here you take it pc's had it ever since so then he sets it aside i go in his garage and i see him go i said shit that's my freaking bike right there he's <laughs> laughing his ass off right because he, he you know he didn't know if i'd recognize it stars and stripes everywhere of course i'm gonna recognize it right but uh he was kind enough to let me have it and so he boxed it all up. He shipped it back to me and I restored it here along with Bill Cody and Bobby Cody. They did a great job and, you know, um, 
I put it back together with not only uh, me. Mm. Now, I'm not a mechanic. Trust me. Everybody knows that. <laughs> but I did most of it, putting it back, uh, reassembling it. And Dennis Segalis and Dennis Segalis, old mecha- mechanic, Kevin Hart, lived in England with Dennis, uh, came one Sunday and helped me finish it all up. So it's really badass. I love it. And then uh, uh, I just got done. Actually, I didn't, but Bill Cody Products and Bobby restored an eight, 1982 uh, world final bike for me. So I have that. Oh. And right now I'm just starting to do my Neil Street. I oh, got my cool. old Neil Street whole oh. bike back. Yeah, I got it. So now I'm restoring it as well. Awesome. Awesome to hear. Maybe one day you have on the side of your house a pedal museum, you know, of all the bikes you had. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not, uh, the way I look at it, I don't have to have it completely original mm. because that's ne- never going to happen. I mean, I like things really shiny and really beautiful looking, but I would say about 90% of it's original, right? Mm. So, and, and the Neil Street is my old bike. And I was able to get my hands on that. So uh, right now uh, the fenders are getting painted because we had painted fenders back in those days. And uh, Bill Cody's got a lot of it. He's really, really helping me out along with Bobby, his son. So they've been great. And I think the biggest thing is, Neil, is that the older I get, the more I really appreciate this stuff. Yeah. Yes, I did appreciate it back then. But, yeah. you know, I you know, I don't have hardly any of, my, any of my stuff anymore. And I, I truly wish I did, you know, because I, I feel as if, you know, it was such a big part of my life. And however, if you talk to my wife, do we really need to put another picture of you on the wall? Do I really need to see more of your trophies here? You know? And the answer is yes, 100%. Yeah. Need more Bruce Penn on the wall. <laughs> no, just one more, dear. Just one more right over here. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, only, it's only this big, you know, that wide, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, yeah. no, I mean, Good times. Do, do your kids like, ever come and talk to you about how was it like riding Speedway back in your day? Or are they just like focus on their own lives now and things like that? You know, uh, you know, Connor was big into motorcycles. Ryan, my second oldest boy, you know, they were all heavy into the Baja. You know, they won the thousand and the five hundred. You know, and we were really involved with off-road racing. And before that, they were in motocross. Uh, Ryan has never ridden a speedway bike. He talks about he'd love to do a couple laps on it. But Connor rode his little junior speedway bike a little bit. Remember Donnie Odom? Yes. Yeah. Donnie Odom. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Doug Nichols, uh, uh, Uncle Doug, he calls him. Yeah. Uh, Donnie and Andy Johnson sponsored Connor on junior speedway bike when he was literally 11 or 12, 12 years old. He was into, you know, riding mini motocross at that time, but he did great on a speedway bike. He really did. He loved it but he always wanted to be a motocrosser, mm. you know, and you know what, that's their decision. If that's what they want to do, I'm fully behind them hundred percent. I was always concerned if they would really take to speedway and they'd want to move to back to England, mm. I would probably have to go there for a while. <laughs> and I still busy with business. It was going to be pretty hard, but that you know, was just, just a joke, you know? Yeah. You never know. You could have so had, yeah, um, uh, Ryan doesn't really ride much. You could you could have had like a concrete company in the UK. You know, you could have had several businesses across the across the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because you know back in those days, there was literally only one McDonald's, and it was in London. We used to go out of our way to go to that McDonald's, and and I was at the funeral for for Betty Bull's funeral, and. Um, in Tamworth, there was like two McDonald's in Tamworth. There was, I mean, there was like, a, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my eyes. I, you know, I, yeah, I was up in Manchester with PC, but I couldn't believe all the fast food chains. And, you know, that was a, that was a good thing for us on the road, you know, to grab a quick burger or something, you know? Yeah. But you can't beat an In-N-Out burger. When I came over there, I love those things. I love oh, them. <laughs> they're insanely good. Yeah. 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 The hundred percent Robert McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. I loved Hard Rock Cafe. 
we used to go to Hard Rock all the time in London, especially mm -hmm. if we were at White City or Wimbledon. We'd head over to, to the Hard Rock and have a burger and, and, yeah, get back home, get ready for the next night. That long drive back up to, back up to the Midlands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, those weren't so bad. Uh, and it, the, the, the tough drives were going like to Exeter and getting rained out and having to drive all the way home. The rainouts would kick your ass pretty good, you know. Yeah, and Exeter's not exactly down the road, is it? So, <laughs> no, I think that was three and a half, four hours from it from Midlands, if my memory serves me correctly. Oh, and I'm not, you know, very young. No, <laughs> no, fair enough. But before we go, Bruce, it's been fantastic talking to you tonight, mate. You know, hearing all your stories and everything. I must just have a quick talk about this this power boating you did with Dennis. You know, um, not just necessarily a world championship on the shower or on a motorbike, but on a boat as well. So, how did this how did this come about? Was it something like out of the blue, or was it like Dennis just turned around and said to you one day, "Let's have a go"? No, I got him to do it. So, oh, Dennis's know? dad and my dad mm -hmm. used to race boats together. Okay. okay, they were in the power boats, you know, way back when, and we were little tiny kids at the time, and followed their racing a little bit. My dad then got into the, the, the airplane racing, the P-51 Mustangs. So when I finished up, I got a call actually from a really good English guy, Nigel Hook. Mm -hmm. English guy lives in, in uh, California here. Said, hey, how would you like to ride with me in my offshore boat? Um, and because you, you don't just ride, you're either a driver or you're the throttle man. It takes two. Okay, yeah. You know, and I loved, I always loved boats and I had my own. I used to pull, you know, marathon skiers in my boat when I finished with Speedway. And I says, yeah, I'd love to. I was still pretty young. My kids were pretty young at that time. I could still kind of get out of the house. So I said, love to, uh, went with him for a season. We did not win the world championship, but I, I, I just really loved it. And I knew Dennis was into it too, although he hadn't raced anything yet. So I said to him, I says, hey, we need to race these boats. And he goes, man, let's talk to my dad. I said, I think that's a really good idea. So Master Tony, we call him, it's Tony Segalis, but we all, we, he's always been Master Tony to us. He's the one that more or less funded our offshore boats. And this isn't an, an easy go. This is a million dollars a year, you know, hobby. Yes, it was a profession, but you didn't make any money at it because it, it's so pricey. And he says, okay. And we built, you know, a Scarab 42 foot boat and, you know, the, the 2000 horsepower motors. And of course he had to have two spares because you could only do one race. They were a hundred miles mm. and then you'd have to go through all the motors. So uh, he and I won four world championships together and he was the throttle man and the throttle man is, is, uh, I mean, it takes two guys, right? And yeah, you have to drive it right. But the throttle man is very intense because he can blow up a motor when you come out of the water, if you overspin it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of good touch and good feel and you have to know what you're doing. And Dennis was a really good throttle man. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mind you, he's like three years younger than me. So, he has bigger balls than I did at that time. So I was scared to death sometimes because he would hammer down and I'm like hanging on. Oh man, I got kids at home. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, yeah. but he, yeah. he was really fast and really good. And we had such a good run at it. And um, uh, finally in the end, I was, I was away from my family again. The risk was high. We had won four world championships. It was such a great run. Um, and so we we finished and then I, the following year after that he got picked up to throttle another boat for i think another two years um but we had a we had a great time it's you know we broke the world record speed record i think at 142 miles an hour now you gotta imagine a 42 foot boat doing like 125 in four foot swells i i Neil, I was getting too old for this, man, because it was scaring the crap out of me, you know. Imagine it was. We had canopies. We were breathing oxygen the whole time. But, man, that was a scary part of my life. But in saying that, I loved it. I loved it. 
Yeah, and I mean, again, it's living on the edge yeah, again, that sort of thing, yeah. you know. So it must have been a good thrill, even though you're at that sort of age where you're thinking, I shouldn't be doing this really. Right. You never thought about that, the younger you were. But as soon as you get kids, then all of a sudden things change. Mm. For me, it did. You know, and yeah, of course, my age, I started getting a little bit, you know, scared a little bit of that stuff. Hey, I've been going fast all my life. It's time to settle down now, you know. Yeah. All these things go through your mind, let me tell you. Yeah. And now you're behind the desk at your own company. So you, you can't get much slower than that now. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pen pusher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm okay with that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you've got your health and everything. So that, that's that's everything you need in it more than anything. Yep. Yep. Feeling good. That's good. Well, I must finish tonight, Bruce. It's been fantastic to have you on the show. You know, um, you've been one I wanted to have on the show for ages, you know, and um, it's great to talk to one of my sort of idols that I watched, okay, many years after you finished, but you're still one of my idols of how good a racer you were and things like that, mate. Thanks a lot, Neil, man. I really appreciate it. And sorry, I kind of lagged on getting back to you on this, you know, uh, uh, but it was good chatting with you. And, you know, thanks for doing your homework, you know. Sorry, I talk a lot. It's kind of been the story of my life, man. I always talk too much. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It makes my life a bit easier, you know, things like that. So, no, but it's been good fun to have you on. <laughs> Thanks a lot again, man. I really appreciate it. Be safe, okay? Yeah. All right, just before I wrap this up, I must say to everyone, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. It's all on there, all the episodes. I've had so many great guests so far. But to have a two-time world champion on the show, it's been amazing to have. And uh, thanks again, Bruce, for everything tonight, mate. I can't wait. I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to watch him from now on. Absolutely. You need to give Siggy a call. He'd love to do it. Well, if you if you give Siggy a message, I have messaged Siggy on Facebook, but he's not got back to me. So, it's a, it, so it's a, yeah, I need to get him on. Okay, show. give him some crap tonight about it. I'll make sure he gets back to you, Neil. All right. Cheers for that, Bruce. Cheers. Okay, buddy. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Say hello to England for me. Will do.